With our information, Papa, 1247 Zulu, wind 2005, visibility 10, sky clear. Temperature 7, dew point minus 2, altimeter 3039. Break visual approach runway 26, departing runway 1. Nice high pressure today, and it's cold, so we'll get good performance. Double check it did everything. Okay, we're good. Space World Ground, good morning, Musketeer 3638, Quebec is at Alpha 6, information, Papa. Uh, VFR South Eastbound. Berlin 339 Romeo Whiskey, Spaceport Tower, Roger, hold short, runway 17, await knife fire release. Musketeer at Alpha 6, say again, your call sign request. That's Musketeer 3638, Quebec's at Alpha 6 with information, Papa, VFR South Eastbound. Musketeer 3638, Quebec, Spaceport Ground, runway 26, run up area, attack to via Alpha 7 Alpha. Musketeer 3638, Quebec is currently at Alpha 6, verify is still clear via Alpha. Musketeer 3638, Quebec, Roger, Alpha 6, Alpha to the uh, run-up area is approved. Alpha 6, Alpha to the run-up area, Musketeer 3, Quebec. They always mess that one up. And 339 are Romeo Whiskey All good. on departure. Alright, so, plan for today. Um, Courier track 321, basically extend downwind. Gonna go over this airplane, some of its characteristics, how I fly it. Um, how it compares to this Cessna, which is really the only thing I can compare it to, because that's what I did my initial training in. Um, and then sort of compare it to what other people have said on the internet. So all your start procedures, run up, all that is almost identical to this Cessna, except it's a low wing, so you use your fuel boost pump on on startup, just because it's not gravity fed to the engine like in the Cessna, because the fuel's or be below you. Okay, we'll do the run-up. So, park brakes set, door seat belts closed and secure. Fuel selector is on the full tank. The trim is set for takeoff. Flight controls. Right. Left. Up. Down. Three. Incorrect. Primer. And in locked. Fuel boost pump. Check operation. Fuel pressure does rise a little bit. Back off. Throttle. 2,000 RPM. Mixture will lean to best power. There's the drop. Back to the peak. Three half turns rich. Check our magnetos. Right mag. About 50 RPM drop. That's good. Back to full. Left mag. About 50 RPM drop. That's good. Back to full. Temperature pressure. Suction's good. We're charging. Fuel pressure's good. Fuel quantity's good. Oil pressure's good. Oil temper's rising. EGT, CHT look good. RP on. Carb temp does rise. RPM drops. Good. Throttle slowly to idle. Do it a couple seconds. Make sure it still runs. Mike it does. Carb beat back in. Back to 1,000 RPM. Right Fuel boost pump on. Flaps. We'll do one notch because we'll do a start with a short field takeoff. Trigger breakers are all in. Fuses are good, secure. Ooh, flight instruments are set. Got this set to tower. Altitude mode on the transponder. Got this set. Got this aligned. And find the DG with the compass. Nav instruments got them right here. Radios set. Transponder altitude mode 1200. Good. Lights got them all on. Before takeoff briefing. All right. Departing runway 26 to the southeast. If we had any issues, initial roll. We're gonna abort immediately. After takeoff with the runway remaining. Just push those down, land, clear the runway. Without one remaining, below 1,000 feet, we're going to go straight ahead. Above 1,000 feet, we're most likely going to still go straight ahead because this airplane doesn't glide super well. Also, there's big open fields. All right, so I got a list of things I want to go over that, like, to compare to, like, the Cessna and just kind of how this airplane flies. Um, we'll start with short field takeoff or light today. I've got two-thirds tank, so 40 gallons. Just me. And it's cold out, so... We'll have a good performance. All right, so we're at 1,822 pounds right now. Super light. Max gross is 2,250. So based off of that. Okay, so it's predicting about a thousand foot roll and 1,828 feet. The clear 50 foot obstacle. This airplane's 56 years old. And me, you know, I'm 56 years old. Damn! I'll expect about 12 to 1,500. Or rotate about 65, climb out at VX, which is also 65, till we get to 50 feet. 
then level out, accelerate. Once we get about 200 feet, uh, slowly raise the flaps. The VY climbs between, well, according to the book is 73. I found between 70 and 80, you get about the same climb rate. Spaceport Tower Musketeer 3638 Quebec at Alpha, or correction, holding short of runway 26 at Alpha Niner, ready for departure. Musketeer 3638 Quebec, Spaceport Tower on departure. Left turn out to the southeast is approved and size of Skyhawk traffic at two mile final. Runway 26 clear for takeoff. Runway 26 clear for takeoff, left turn southeast bound approved. Musketeer 38 Quebec. Hey, we'll get on the runway. I've got that traffic. He's a few miles out, so we've got plenty of room. We'll get on the center line. We'll use every inch of runway. Hold the brakes, go full power, make sure everything's in the green. Release the brakes, rotate about 65, climb out 65, level out to 75. For our short field takeoff. Center line, I see 262626. Hold the brakes and go full power. And the gauges are in the green. Release the brakes. Heels to the floor. Air speed's alive. Got 40 knots. Got 50 knots. Already flying on our own, so we'll accelerate to 65 and then keep climbing out 65. Till we get about 50 feet, level out, accelerate to about 75. Then we'll slowly bring, some, bring the flaps up. All right, we're safe altitude, slowly raise the flaps. Continue climbing out, about 75 knots. Getting 600 feet a minute right now, that's really good for this airplane at this altitude. All right, we'll start the fuel timer. I go about 30 minutes on each side before I switch because there's no bolt setting on the fuel selector. Level out here at pattern altitude until we get out of his airspace. Musketeer 3638, Quebec, remain outside of class, bravo, freedom change approved. Remain outside class, bravo, freedom change approved. Thank you, through Quebec. All right, so I'm away from any busy airspace. First thing I want to go over about this airplane is just really how it flies and how the flight controls feel. Uh, in this Cessna, I don't know if you've ever flown them, but the flight controls feel pretty heavy and not super responsive. Um, in here, I mean, the controls are so light. I mean, the tip of your fingers, no problem and way more responsive. You can easily get way more roll rate out of it than the 172. Um, so the flight controls are significantly lighter, um, especially on the ailerons. The ailerons are way lighter, but the pitch is only a little bit lighter. So that results in this airplane, the pressure for the elevator and the ailerons are slightly unbalanced. There is quite a bit more pressure on the, on the pitch. Um, and as far as rudder goes, I mean, once again, super, super light. Um, it is a very small rudder and a small vertical stabilizer proportionally to the size of the airframe. Um, doesn't mean it's unstable or anything, it's just maybe slightly less effective than the rudder on a Cessna, but the pressures are so much lighter. The ailerons are super light, super responsive, but as a result, I mean, they're huge. But as a result, you do get quite a lot of adverse yaw, so you need to use that rudder. Well, this is no rudder, and I mean, the nose just swings. But if you add in some rudder with your, with your roll, keep it nice and coordinated, it does beautiful. And then, as far as the rudder goes, it's super light off the top, the pressures. But as you get further into it, the if you move it the same amount, it gets less effective. So here is a rudder, well, just a little bit of rudder. Sort of effective. This is about a half rudder, and it kind of just stops. And if you go full, it really doesn't do that much more. So it's sort of the opposite of progressive. The more you get into it, the less effective it is. Like, I'll do a slip here. I mean, that's about half rudder. Then go to full rudder slip, and it barely moves at all. But if you go from half rudder to a quarter rudder, it's a much bigger difference. So just interesting characteristics. I think it has to do with how the aircraft is shaped and just how the air interacts with the empennage and the tail services. And the one thing a lot of people say about this airplane, which is partially true, but not as much of an issue as they make it out to be, it is a nose-heavy airplane, 
but it doesn't make it a bad flying airplane. Like, I think right now my CG's at 112 inches, according to my weight and balance. The leading edge of the wing is at 102, so that's 10 inches back from the leading edge, which equates to probably 15 to 20 percent back from the of the cord from the leading edge. And if you're uh, familiar with model airplanes, uh, a nose-heavy airplane is about a quarter, about 25 percent back from the leading edge is about where a, a plane flies well or starts to feel nose-heavy. You usually want it in the 25 to 30 percent range. So. Comparatively to that, this is a nose-heavy airplane, but I mean, I'm comparing it to an RC plane. Well, aerodynamics just work better when you go bigger, so it's not as much or as noticeable as it is on an RC airplane, but it is it is definitely a nose-heavy airplane. Um, now, a lot of people say that this airplane, like the pitch and yaw, get blanked out when you start going slower. And I haven't really noticed that too much. They make it out to be this huge deal that you have to be really on top of. Like on landings, they say you get too slow, you'll lose all your uh, pitch authority. Well, yeah, then you're basically stalled, as with any airplane. As far as rudder effectiveness or getting blanked out, I haven't felt that at all. Now, it is a small horizontal stab or stabilator because the whole thing moves. Um, and the fuselage is pretty wide. One interesting thing I've noticed is that, like, when the bugs get stuck to your airplane, they're usually all over it, but on the tail, the, about the inside foot or so, the stabilator on each side, there's no bugs on it. So either it's slightly blanked out in the middle there, or uh, it's just getting more turbulent air. But I haven't found it to negatively affect the performance at all. With flaps, um, in a Cessna, they pitch the thing up like crazy and you need to be on top of it. With this, on the other hand, it pitches down, but not too aggressive at all. It more pitches down, but increases the lift, so you don't really descend or climb or anything. You just start flying more nose down. It just reduces the deck angle. I'll show you here. I'll slow down a little bit. We're at 80 knots. Go one notch of flaps. See how the nose lowered do have to add a little bit of forward pressure. We'll add our second notch. See, nose lowered. But we're not descending or climbing at all. We're just flying with more nose down. Then if you go third notch of flaps, 35 degrees, I mean, we're not descending or climbing right now. It's just flying nose down. Like my VSI is at zero feet per minute. We're level. But one thing in a Cessna, you know, at 40 degrees of flaps, the thing almost doesn't want to climb, or at least in the 160 horsepower ones at this elevation. Now, I'm holding altitude no problem at about 75% power. I go to full power. I mean, it's draggy, but I mean, I'm climbing at 300 feet a minute. 70 knots. Yeah, about 300 feet a minute with full flaps, which is not bad. Granted, you're never going to want to necessarily climb with full flaps, but if you ever need to do a go-around, you know you have the extra performance to do so, which is nice. On the topic of climb performance, this is it's 160 horsepower. Uh, max gross is 2250 or pounds, and it is a bigger airplane than a Cessna. It is wider. It is more draggy. It doesn't climb quite as well. I've noticed about 100 feet per minute less in the climb, so I'm it's just me in here today. I'm at two thirds tanks, 8,500 MSL. Let's see what I get in terms of climb. We'll start with the book recommended climb speed or max climb by for from the book, which is 73. All right, there's our 73 knots. We'll get stabilized here, and we're getting about 500 feet a minute. Let's bring it back to about 70 knots. See what it's doing. There's 70. We're looking about 600 feet a minute. And then we'll bring it up to about 80 for sort of a cruise climb. If it'll accelerate. There we go. There's 80. Let me get back in the climb. Yeah, 80 looks about 400 feet a minute. So, interestingly enough, 70 knots or below the book VY, you actually get a better climb rate. Um, now, there's a couple theories for that. One, 
the POH goes off of having no wingtips. Uh, this has the added uh, drooping wingtips for extra lift. It does add a bit of extra drag, but it, it definitely helps the performance, I think. Um, so I think that's part of the why, part of the reason it changes. I suppose the old instruments could be slightly inaccurate too. But we'll go off of that. We'll say 70 knots in here is about the best climb you'll get. Anything lower than that and you're just starting to get behind the power curve, which is not a super safe place to be if you were to have any issues. And then uh, same thing for glide speeds, for best glide speeds um, with the wingtips. Um, it does not at all match up with the POH. We'll do a couple runs here. Best glide, um, according to operating manual, is uh, 78 knots indicated airspeed. Now we'll do that here, and I'll just show you how much forward pressure it requires in order to get that. So what I'm going to do to test this, I'm here at 9,000 feet. I'm going to stabilize at the airspeed. Once I get to 85, I'll start a timer until I get to 75, um, and then I'll look at uh, descent rate, and then I'll do some nerd math and figure out how what distance we're covering in that in that time, based on our descent rate and speed and everything. And I'll do that for a couple different speeds. Okay, so we're going to do this first run, uh, testing glide distance and uh, rate of descent uh, at the recommended or V VG speed, which is is 78 knots. Uh, then we'll try it at 70 and see if it's any different. I, well, actually I already know which is better, but um, the wingtips do add a bit of drag and change the way the wing creates a lift for the better, for the most part. Um, but it does change those speeds a little bit, so you want to be aware. All right, let's pick a heading, keep this consistent. All right, we'll call that a 180 heading. Get our timer ready, heartbeat on. Bring the power to idle, and in order to keep it at 78 knots, you have to push. I mean, look how fast I'm descending. Okay, it'll stabilize at 78. Okay, there we go. We got it trimmed out. According to the book, this is our best glide. There we go. Started. We'll time how long it takes to get the descent a thousand feet, keeping our airspeed as close to 78 as we can, keeping it coordinated, throttle idle, showing. A thousand feet a minute descent. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not our best glide. <laughs> okay, there is 7,500 feet. Okay, we'll go ahead and recover. The, about a thousand feet per minute to descend a thousand feet a minute. So I'll write that down. Yeah, the first time I did that, I'm like, there is no way that's best glide speed. So 78 knots. Because, I mean, the wingtips add a bunch of lift and a bunch of drag. So in order to get to that 78, you have to really force it down, and then you're most likely above its most efficient state. This time I will pitch for 70 knots. So we'll line up with the same road I had before, in the same spot, so the wind and everything, the atmosphere conditions are the same as before to try and keep this consistent. All right, reset the timer. Repeat on, let's lower the power, bring it to idle. We'll pitch for our 70 knots. Try and get stabilized here. Yeah, I can already tell this is way better because I'm only doing 500 feet, 600 feet a minute down. And it, it just feels happier. There's our 8,500. Start timer. Okay, now I'm showing 800 feet a minute down at 70 knots. So definitely less descent rate, but we're also going slower, so we're covering less distance. So I predict the distance traveled will be about the same. But this is definitely giving us more time in the air. If anything were to happen, this would be a better situation to be in. Beach creeping up a little bit. I'll get it back to 70. It was about 73 for a couple seconds. I'll try and keep this as consistent as I can. But I'm not a perfect pilot, so we'll do our best. And there's 7,500 feet. All right, so we got a minute and 17 seconds on that one to descend at 70 knots. That gave us an extra 17 seconds over that 1,000 foot period, which if it was an actual emergency situation, that's actually a lot of time to compose yourself and figure out what's going on. All right, one thing I noticed for climbing 
and actually climbs really well with one notch of flaps. So we'll go 15 degrees and see what kind of uh, climb rate we can get out of it. All right, let's pitch for 70 knots. Actually, we'll stabilize at 65 since we got a bunch of extra lift. So yeah, 500 feet a minute at 65 knots with one notch flaps. Once we get to 70 though, the extra drag is now overpowering the lift and we're only getting 300 feet a minute. So what if we bring it back even more? There's 65, looks 5 to 600 feet a minute, that's really good. What about 60? At 60 we're getting 500 feet a minute. So if you need, if you don't have as much room in the climb or to climb or if you have an obstacle to clear, uh, climbing with flaps is going to be very helpful because you get almost the same climb rate as without flaps but you're going slower so your climb gradient is much steeper so you can clear obstacles better and because of that what I'm now interested to try is my glide speed at 65 knots with one notch of flaps to see what kind of sink rate I'm getting. So this is good to do, like test your performance numbers, make sure that what the book is saying is actually what the airplane does. We'll try 15 degrees of flaps at 65 knots, see what our sink rate and speed and uh, distance covered is. We'll start slowing up here, get our car beat in, first notch of flaps. All right, there's 65, let's bring the idle, see where it stabilizes. Actually hold itself very stable at that speed. Five, start the timer. Look about 700 feet a minute down, so about the same as before, interesting. It's very happily just sitting right about 65 knots though. 300 feet to go, we're at a minute and 5 seconds. Alright, coming up on our 7500 feet, there we go. Alright, looks like a minute 23 seconds. Interesting. Now there's a million different configurations I could test. I could make a whole video about it. I'm trying not to bore you today. I'm trying not to bore you today. To bore you today. But looks like that specific speed and that setup gave us a little even more time. So that's a minute 23 and a half seconds. And then one thing to consider too is pushing the nose down for 78 knots is a lot more dramatic than just like chilling there, 15 degrees of flaps at 65. Like at 78, you can hear the wind, you can hear the wind like forcing the prop to windmill. And it's actually a more stressful situation if it were an emergency. So maybe that's one thing to consider too. Maybe, yeah, you buy more time, maybe cover a little less distance with 65 uh, knots at 15 degrees, but maybe it'll help you remain more calm just because there's less going on, the airplane's more stabilized, um, and it's just a more relaxed environment. Plus, at that configuration, you're already basically set up for a good landing uh, with no power. like. You'll probably want to go second notch of flaps for landing, but that's less things you have to do. So maybe you're already, if it were an engine failure um, force landing situation, you're already better set up to land. So that's one less thing you have to think about. Plus it buys you more time to run through the checklist, maybe even get it restarted, or maybe you missed an item in your flow. I don't know. There's a lot of things to consider, and honestly, there's a million different configurations I could test for glide speeds and climb speeds. I could make a whole video about it. If you want to see that, let me know. I'd be happy to do that. Okay, so here's the path of our airplane. You gotta can make it a triangle because you gotta um, consider that we're descending a thousand feet as well as traveling forward. So our actual path is a downward slope. Um, so to find the distance here, this is the first distance we find because that's the that's the path along which your speed is being measured. So do a little unit conversion, 78 knots is 78 nautical miles per hour. Multiply that by one hour, which is 60 minutes. This is basically just one, that's how you do a unit conversion. Then times the time, which is one minute, because that's how long it took to descend a thousand feet for the first test. Give us our distance here, then use Pythagorean formula like a nerd. Um, plug your values in. This is a negative right here. But um, because I used pen, I forgot to put it, and then I didn't really want to redraw everything, so I just put the negative right there. That is a negative. Um, so we found our distance across the ground to be 1.289 nautical miles. And then just because why not, I wanted to see what angle it was at. So that's pretty easy trig. Sine, remember, is opposite. 
over hypotenuse. So that's 1 6 over 1.3 inverse sine to get the theta, which is your angle, which is about 7.37. Do the same thing for tests 2 and 3, and we find that our distance across the ground for tests 2 and 3, about 1.5 nautical miles each, and they have about exactly the same almost angle. So, interestingly enough, the best glide from the book is actually not your best glide under my configurations at least because it got you the least amount of time in the air and the least distance covered. And these were almost identical, but test three gives you an extra, I believe it was six seconds on top of it. So, some interesting things to consider. All right, as far as cruise speeds go, is the next thing I'm going to look at real quick. So let's say 2450 RPM in a Cessna, you usually, what I found I'd indicate about 100 to 105 knots indicated airspeed in cruise at 2450. And this airplane, I am indicating 90. So yes, it is a much slower airplane. Well, not much, but it is slower. It's just a happy little airplane that cruises along at 90 knots. Plus with this Cessna, I flew in, holds 43 gallons. Uh, you could opt for long range tanks. Those hold 53 gallons. This airplane holds 59.8 gallons. So, and I found in a Cessna, I ended up burning about seven to eight gallons an hour. They say that's what this burns and that's what you'd expect because it's the exact same engine. But I've noticed about six to seven in this airplane. So I've got a comfortable, if I'm topped off to dry, so going from topped off tanks to dry, I can easily get eight hours. So with an hour reserve, uh, I have a comfortable seven hours of fuel on board, which is outstanding. So as far as long range goes for this airplane, it's fantastic. But at this altitude, you lean it out to get about, I don't know, 1250 on the EGTs. That's how I do my, uh, how do I set my mixture? So in cruise, I like 1240 to 1250 on the EGTs. And then that means the CHT or cylinder head temperature temps out about 350 to 370, depending on the outside air temperature. I really like this airplane. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to own it, to fly it, to have it help me with my career. I don't know what I did to deserve it, and I know not many people get the opportunity. To, so I try and honor it, be grateful and respect it, be responsible, try and make the most out of it. Next thing I shall do, we'll do some slow flight and stalls.